Welcome back to The Real News Network. We're with Sony Kapoor in San Francisco talking about finance capital and the crisis and what we should do about it. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. So you spoke in the last segment about some principles that you think should be embodied in, in, in a solution. Is the legislation, are the measures so far taken by the Obama administrations and the proposed reforms that we're told are on the table, do they fulfill any of these principles? Uh, they're, they're broadly in the right direction, but I don't think they go far enough. So for example, uh, when we talk about simplicity, uh, one of the proposals is to force all the uh, derivatives to get settled in a centralized exchange, which wouldn't make the product simpler, but at least it would shine the light of transparency on them. So people would know about it, regulators would know about it, which is a good step. Uh, there has also been a proposal to push as much of those complex products as possible on exchanges, which would mean there would be some standardization and simplification. There is a proposal of the uh, Consumer Protection Agency, which will look more closely at the financial products being offered to consumers, which I'm assuming will mean that they will try and simplify them so as to, you know, consumers shouldn't be buying something uh, that they don't understand. So I think that in terms of product simplification, there's a move in the right direction. There's another interesting proposal, uh, which is that big financial institutions will be made to write their living will. The idea would be to map out, if you're Citibank, how, if there was a problem, would Citibank be wound up in the most cost-efficient way in the shortest time possible. Now, that's a very good opportunity for simplifying the legal structures of these banks, because as they stand now, as we are finding out with the bankruptcy of Lehman, 330 subsidiaries spread all around the world, complex liabilities, non-transparent, off-balance sheet vehicles. These are institutions that are just too complicated to fail. You know, it's very... It's, it's the most complex bankruptcy ever. And if Citicorp were to go down, that would just, it, it would tie up the court cases and everything for years and years to come. So the act of making these institutions write a viable will, which let's say, you know, should have a requirement that this should be able to be carried out within two weeks time or within three weeks time or something, would necessarily mean that the legal structures would need to be drastically simplified. So that would be a way of catching your nose around uh, around your head, but it would still be a way of simplifying the structure. So I think that simplification principle is the, the, it, it is fairly represented in the uh, in the proposals. But you say they don't go far enough, and and sometimes not going far enough means you really haven't done anything at all. So are we there? Well, I mean, we in, in the sense of avoiding another crash. Well, no, we're, we're, we're very far from avoiding another crash. I mean, a lot of these are just ideas being floated around. Nothing's actually been legislated for, nothing very significant. But uh, also, I think, take, taking all the proposals together, uh, whatever is being floated around the G20, in the US, etc., it is going to make the system more robust than it has been, um, perhaps more resilient. Um, but it's not very clear that it's going to... Uh, help us avoid a uh, big financial crash and crisis. And the fact of the matter is that financial crises have been with us since long before CDOs and uh, subprime mortgages were around, and they will be with us. So it's always a trade-off of how far you go to avoid another crash. But I still, don't, I still think that there's more to be done in the direction of going towards more stability, even at the cost of less efficiency or less dynamism in the system. It's a trade-off. So, uh, the fragility in the system, the stampede effect of all the investors heading into the same buckets, the underlying problem of lack of purchasing power. Is anything on the table now in front of Congress going to change any of those fundamentals? Uh, or have we just said there's going to be a, you can't elbow as you go around your musical chairs? Yeah. Well, I think that there's a, this diversity principle that I referred to, that, that is a, perhaps the least represented in the proposals because it's part of the knee-jerk reaction. You know, something goes wrong, the idea is, hey, we need to regulate more. Uh, something goes wrong, the idea is we need to have higher standards. Something goes wrong, and the idea now is to bring in other institutions, shadow financial system, etc., which were not being regulated into the realm of regulation. But there is a danger that this mindset itself is, uh, is the problem, and that mindset that increasing standardization, higher standards for everybody, more uniform standards for everybody, would lead to better outcomes. This only works if you're the only institution 
you're the only financial institution and you're applying this and everybody else is doing exactly what they would have done otherwise. But the fact of the matter is that these standards are going to be applied to every institution at the same time, which actually might reduce the diversity of the financial system even more and make it even more brittle. So what we need is to rethink this philosophy. Because uh, under this kind of regulation, everyone's going to wind up even doing more of the same thing, but with the same motivation. Exactly. How do you get? How do you extract as much as you possibly can out of your client with the money? Yeah. And and, and also, it shouldn't be forgotten how much of this investment money does still go into various mines and enterprises, yeah. which is all about lowering wages. Because the only way you're going to maximize your return is to. We've been doing a story about the Valley Inco strike in Sudbury. Uh, it's a nickel mine. Right. And Valley has come in with a great bravado how they're going to make Canadians accept wages closer to Indonesia and Brazil and working conditions to kind of the, the, the issue of creating a kind of labor discipline globally. This is part of what helps make this return on capital. Right. None of that's going to change. So you wind up with less purchasing power globally. Uh, that's, that's a very serious problem. And one part of addressing that is through some of the tax issues that we spoke about. That uh, it's not just that the wages are lower, but it's also that the post-tax, because there, there's, there's pre-tax inequality and then there's post-tax inequality. And the ways of attacking uh, the problem are both. You, know, you, you have a higher minimum wage and you pull down some of the wages from the top, which are excessive, which lead to risk-taking behavior, some of these bonuses. That means slightly more equity in the system, more purchasing power, you know, better economy. But at the same time, you need to have a tax system where the top is paying its fair share, the corporates are paying their fair share and not getting away with using tax havens, etc. The financial institutions are paying their fair share. That would mean a lower tax burden on the lower income groups, you know, be it uh, sales tax or other forms of taxes that they pay. So both of these taken together could mean that we end up with a more equitable system, which actually is intimately linked not just to long-term economic growth, but also to financial stability. Now, some people have suggested a well, one could call more radical idea, except in some way it's coming from the Obama administration, but not in relation to finance. If a public option is needed to keep health insurance companies accountable, then why not a public option to keep the finance sector accountable? If your objective is to get money into the hands of people to buy houses and businesses to make investments, then not, why not a public option where they could go get that money and let the wealthy who are trying to recycle their money, they can worry, put their money in the finance sector and hope for the best. But why not a public option for people who need this kind of, uh, need credit to do more productive activity? Well, the fact of the matter is you have had public options. I mean, the, uh, the big mortgage agencies uh, were they're put there for a particular purpose. They were supported by the government and they did manage to extend significant home ownership to the United States citizens. It's, uh, you know, you have been offering 30 year mortgages for a very long time now, uh, which many other countries don't. Home now, ownership. Now, a lot, of the, a lot of people blame this crisis to some extent on those, those companies. So what is their responsibility here and, and did it have to go this way? I think the Big problem was that these agencies at one point were kind not very Fannie Mae clear. Such, Fannie Mae yeah. and Freddie Mac. They were not very clear where they belonged, whether they belonged in the private sector and whether or whether they belonged in the public sector. And there was an ambiguity to it, which the government's, you know, the administrations let hang for a long time. So you had this strange situation where they were trying to fulfill a public uh, sec public goal, you know, social good. Uh, in an in a economically efficient way, which, which they were more or less succeeding in doing. But the management was actually thinking of uh, that they were competitors for Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley and paying themselves accordingly and getting those bonuses and getting in on the same acts that these investment banks were in. Uh, and that was the part of the problem. It was this lack of clarity as to whether these were public institutions fulfilling a public good or whether they were private institutions competing with Goldman and Morgan Stanley. So a public institution with a clear public mandate to be a facilitator of credit, this is a, something that can work? 
this is something that can definitely work and there are gaps in the market. There are gaps in too little credit going to small and medium enterprises. There are gaps in many African Americans in the poorest communities not having access to bank accounts even now in the richest country in the world. Uh, there are gaps in terms of credit provision to people who are forced to go to payday loan agencies, which give credit at 2,500% sometimes every year, which is ridiculous. Uh, so there are several gaps in the financial markets which are not being filled by the private sector. These gaps need to be filled. So it's not that you need to introduce a public option where the private sector is doing a good job. And I think this is a similar de debate in the healthcare. Uh, it's not that the idea behind the public option is to replace what the private sector is doing. It's to correct market failure. The market failure is there are 40 million Americans without health insurance. That failure needs to be addressed. That's a public policy problem. And one way of addressing is to put forward a public option. But where is the private sector doing a good job when it comes to credit? Because you see this tremendous speculation winds up freezing the whole credit market. Well, so, if, you, if, you look, if you look at the financial system, I mean, this, this has been a slight problem with the crisis. It's, it's a big beast. There are pension funds, there are insurance firms, there are local savings banks, there are credit unions, there are you know, regional banks. There's a, it's, it's a very big financial system full of several diverse actors. Yet, if you look at just the media, if you look at the debate, the state of the debate, the only ones who are active in the media, the only ones we hear from are the investment banks, hedge funds and private equity. The big pension funds, the sovereign wealth funds, all the other actors are absent from the debate. And many of those other parts of the financial system, not the AIG insurance firm, you know, but many of the other financial parts of the financial system are continuing to perform their job reasonably well. They have been doing the right thing. And it's this particular part of the financial system, which was investment uh, banks primarily, a bit of commercial banks and some hedge fund and private equity problems, which led to the financial crisis and the economic crisis, which has also affected these other parts of the financial system. So what we need is voices from these other sections of finance to come and say, hey, guys, you screwed us over. You screwed the real economy over. We need the rules of the game to change. And we haven't heard that. So I well, think that well, voice well, is the, missing. Well, in the next segment of our interview, let's talk a bit about the voice that's certainly not missing, and maybe it's the loudest voice, and that's Goldman Sachs. Please join us for the next segment of The Real News, and we're going to talk about Goldman Sachs.